Hi, and welcome to Futures Discovery on John Lothian News. I'm your host, Cortez Draper, and on this program, we'll embark on the fascinating world of futures and learn from top professionals in the field. Today, we're diving into the intricate world of spoofing, a topic that can profoundly impact the integrity of your futures trading journey. Spoofing is a manipulative strategy where traders place fake orders to create a misleading impression of market demand and supply. These orders are intended to deceive other market participants, tricking them into making trading decisions based on false information. In the realm of futures trading, spoofing stands out as a disruptive force. It's a fraudulent activity that distorts market data, leading to false price movements and an unfair trading environment. Spoofing not only complicates trading, but it also diminishes market liquidity. This results in a wider bid to ask spread and compromised price discovery, making it harder for traders to determine the true value of an asset. Moreover, spoofing increases the risk for clearinghouses. This deceptive practice creates unpredictable market behavior, making it challenging to manage and mitigate risk effectively. For hedgers, spoofing becomes a significant obstacle. It distorts market conditions they rely on to make informed decisions about entering or exiting a position. Essentially, spoofing disrupts the cohesive force that holds futures markets together, threatening its operation and efficiency. But the consequences of spoofing don't end with market disruption. Spoofing is a federal crime with severe penalties. Traders caught engaging in spoofing face up to 10 years in prison and fines up to $1 million per violation. These legal repercussions highlight the seriousness of maintaining market integrity it's crucial for the dynamics of futures trading that we uphold a fair and transparent trading environment. Market integrity ensures that price reflects true supply and demand, fostering trust among market participants. Without it, the futures market would struggle to function effectively, harming everyone from individual traders to large institutions. So what can we do to combat spoofing? Market regulators and exchanges are continuously enhancing their surveillance and enforcement measures to detect and deter spoofing activities. It's also important for traders to stay informed and vigilant reporting any suspicious activities they encounter. And there you have it, a quick overview of spoofing and the multitude of reasons not to do it. Now remember, this is just scratching the surface. To gain deeper insights, let's talk to Ronaldo Mariotti current partner at Paul Haston, who brings a wealth of experience in the legal industry. In addition to his work in private practice, Renato has served as a legal analyst for CNN and served as an assistant United States attorney at the United States Attorney's Office. Renato brings his extensive experience in legal matters to shed light on his deceptive trading practice, discussing its implications, legal challenges, and ongoing efforts to combat it. Join us for an insightful conversation that will deepen your understanding of spoofing and its impact on financial markets. Renato, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Can you explain in your own words what spoofing is and how it typically manifests in financial future markets? Spoofing is whenever you enter an order in the market that you intend to cancel before it's executed. And that intention is really what makes uh, it's spoofing. In other words, your intention is when the orders enter, not later. In other words, it's very common for uh, market participants to enter orders and then see something happening in that market or elsewhere. And decide that okay, I've changed my mind. I don't want. I don't want. I don't want this bill. They need to to cancel or modify the order. But really, um, the the hallmark of spoofing is when you enter the order knowing you don't want it to be filled. And so technically speaking, entering a single order in a live trading environment that you're just uh, using to test your, your new software, for example. Uh, but if you enter it and cancel it immediately thereafter, knowing that you were gonna do that from the beginning, that's technically spoofing. The way it manifests itself usually is in a trading pattern in which a market participant is entering large orders on one side of the market while they have a smaller quantity on the other side. And the idea is that when those large orders are entered and then very soon thereafter canceled, it's creating a perception that there's movement in the market or that there's something happening on one side of the market. There's a, there's a market 
uh, depth that isn't actually there that generates fills that might not otherwise occur. Now, when I was investigating, prosecuting the first ever case, this was all very novel and I was very careful about my assertions because you don't technically have to prove any of these things in order to prove that spoofing occurs. But over the years, now that I'm on the defense side, um, you know, there's more, you know, there's more and more aggressive government positions being taken about what spoofing is and what spoofing does. And at times I've faced off against the government. And I've even defeated the Justice Department in trial uh, because they've taken more aggressive actions regarding spoofing. Yes. I mean, within itself, it seems very dynamic. Uh, um because there's so many, you know, you have to be able to understand what someone's true intentions are. Um, and I, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more too on this on how do you detect the pattern? So you said the pattern of constantly doing something it doesn't seem like something you could catch one time, but if someone continuously tries to um, in, add an order, cancel it, is that typically what happens? How do you catch it? What do you get an eye for? Maybe this is something that's funny here. Well, it's like, first of all, back in the, in the beginning, there's no software. Uh, created to detect spoofing it was a new uh, new focus for regulators. And really at the time, the way that it was detected was by market participants reporting what they were seeing in the market. Market participants saying, hey, I am, I see this happening and I see, keep seeing all this large quantity that's disappearing in the market. Typically speaking, it was people who were entering large size in the you know, whether, you know, for if the typical order size in a particular market was one, two, or three lots, entering 100 lots, 200 lots, and then canceling it soon thereafter. Just like when you speed uh, 56 miles an hour in a 55 zone, it doesn't capture the attention of the police, but you're going 120 miles an hour, it captures their attention. That sort of thing was capturing the attention of market participants who would report to market regulation about what they were seeing in the market. That That's how, the first ever spoofing case, the Michael Cassia case, started. In trial, I actually put on um, the testimony of various market participants who reported this to the uh, exchange. But, um, you know, that evolved over time, you know, and, and even at that time, I should note that at the time that the Cassia case was there, it was not the only um, spoofing case that was under investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office at that time. And that case was one that we chose to bring in large part because uh, it was such an egregious case and it was easy to demonstrate because his volume was so high in terms of what he was entering, what he was canceling. But now things have evolved in a, in a they're much more sophisticated. There's software out there, Aventus and many others have built software that is used to, to detect the patterns um, of spoofing and it's software that it's used not only by market participants themselves to police their own traders, but it's used by regulators, a software of that type. And so they're essentially constantly looking to see if this sort of pattern exists. And usually now it's caught very early. So there were for a period of time, many uh, spoofing cases that were quite large, generating massive settlements. We don't really see that anymore. We see very small cases and fewer cases that are being brought by the regulators. And it's because those cases are caught very early. And so I represent spoofers now, uh, allegedly uh, spoofers, I should say alleged spoofers, but those are people who are, um, you know, dealing with cases that are in the five figures rather than the seven, eight or nine figures. That makes a lot of sense. And it's also very interesting to hear how it started with market participants kind of coming forward. Um, you know, today we have, you know, the the blessings to have technologies do a lot of work for us. But back, you know, when the first cases were around, it was other participants saying, hey, there's something wrong here. Um, and that's very interesting to hear. And you talk about large deceptive orders, especially in the first kind of realm of spoofing. Can you discuss the, the broader impact, maybe especially back then before they became small and less frequent um, on market integrity and investor confidence? Because hearing this from a market participant, um, it makes me wonder how this impacted the overall market landscape. Well, it would be very frustrating just to certain market participants, particularly those who are slower, right? If you're a bona fide hedger, trying to fill large quantities and it keeps disappearing and you can be very frustrating. But for sophisticated uh, um, outfits, 
uh, you know, sophisticated trading firms, it would sometimes generate losses. Now, I will say that, the, you know, some of those trading firms did come forward. They did testify at trial, um, not just the Acacia trial, but other trials that the Justice Department and the CFTC brought. Uh, but in the long run, I think those large, sophisticated market participants ended up making more money off the spoofers than the other way around because they were there. They became sophisticated at um, taking advantage of the spoofers' tactics, which were not that sophisticated. Just, but this, you know, the spoofers did make money, often uh, from less sophisticated market participants. That's how it became successful. It's not as um, profitable today of course, given the amount of surveillance and attention. But at the time, uh, it had a significant influence on the market. And I was told after I left the U.S. Attorney's Office and I talked to market participants that they did see a very substantial change in the market after the case that I had made. Once an actual indictment came forward and people saw that you could be charged for doing this, uh, it definitely sent a message to the industry. It's good to hear that, you know, those guys <laughs> um, got justice, but I know you're defending the alleged ones now, but um, it, it's good to hear that the start of it. Um, and we talked a little bit before about um, your start of your career at the CME, and we spent a lot of time talking about um, market participants at this point, but can you talk about how spoofing increases re uh, risk for clearinghouses and what measures clearinghouses take to mitigate these risks now? There, of course, are very significant cases involving FCMs. There was one, for example, FCM that was clearing um, Igor Oystacher, uh, who was named in a CFTC order for spoofing, one of the earlier spoofing cases. And there, um, you actually had an FCM that was called out for um, uh, not um, you know, taking action when they were receiving inquiries from the regulator. Uh, for to shut shut down Mr. Roy Satcher's trading activity. I mean, the reality is regulators hold FCMs responsible for uh, the trading that takes place using um, their services, their platform, et cetera. There, so if they clear a trade, ultimately, uh, they can potentially be held responsible by the regulator. And so FCMs themselves now are engaging in monitoring and oversight and it just is another adds to the responsibilities that FCMs have that, um, uh, you know, makes their lives more difficult. It's a, it's a challenging business as a result. I know you've seen a fair share of cases. What are some of the legal penalties for those that are engaging in spoofing? Well, in the past, when you had very large scale alleged spoofing schemes, uh, the penalties were very large. You know, in their first ever spoofing case, he only went to prison for a few years. But there were people later who not only um, were state facing prison time, but were paying very substantial amounts of money, um, mi millions of dollars ultimately to the regulators as part of a resolution uh, on those spoofing cases. And you know, for a period of time, um, the Justice Department was very actively pushing the envelope, doing everything from charging RICO schemes amongst the uh, spoofers, um, there's also a, a case that I mean, perhaps even more well known than the first ever spoofing case that I was involved in. I, I represented Jitesh the car, um, the first ever non-trader charged with spoofing. And if you're wondering how a non-trader can be charged with spoofing, uh, that I, that was my look uh, when I was found out about this case, where literally my client was a software developer wow. uh, who developed a piece of software, and they're like, "Well, you are aiding and abetting spoofing." And, inspiring with a spoofer and I had to defeat the Justice Department in that trial to secure his freedom but there you know you you, you saw the pushing of an envelope by um, the Justice Department trying to um, increase penalties um, increase the reach of that statute and I think um, that was unfortunate because really what I saw the benefit of that statute from the beginning from when I was looking at it, you know, I, I was doing this long enough to be in the pre-spoofing world, and then at the dawn of the post-spoofing world, uh, I created the post, uh, you know, created that with that first case, I suppose. But in the pre-spoofing world, you had a challenge that regulators had to bring enforcement matters when there was disruptive trading practices, because it was very difficult to prove um, market manipulation. 
And so given how the, the high bar there was to prove the existence of an artificial price, what ended up happening was the cases would end up getting resolved with much smaller penalties. And the idea and the, the, the allure of spoofing to a prosecutor is it's much more straightforward to prove. You don't have to prove an artificial price. You don't have to show that there was an even a price movement or an attempt to price move. All you have to do is show this intent to cancel, which is much easier to do. And so, you know, if, if, if the prosecutors and the regulators stick to that sort of conduct, there won't be that many cases anymore because there's so much surveillance and so much oversight. But you're, you're capturing, I think, conduct that's problematic in a very straightforward and, um, you know, efficient way. I think the, the problem is just when regulators or prosecutors get so far over their skis that they're trying to, you know, jump, you know, you know, jump the penalties up so much or expand the reach of the statute so much that they're creating difficult cases for themselves. How do you think technology, um, since you've seen the first case um, to now, has aided but also, um, you know, helped spoofers become more um, intelligent in their practices? So spoofing has evolved because the, the, the obvious cases of spoofing now are more easily caught. They're caught much earlier by the exchange because of the surveillance software. Um, so spoofers now um, are really, if there's any substantial scheme, it's usually a cross market scheme, uh, cross pro, you know, not just cross product, but actually separate exchanges, separate you know, um, you know, uh, instruments, that sort of thing, where there's, where it's harder for software to detect that spoofing. Um, so it does still, it, it can still exist in a more robust way, but there's less of that. Um, I will say that, you know, separate and apart from the surveillance software, you know, one thing that has also happened is just an increased awareness of spoofing. I mean, when I first was, you know, bringing that, that first case, but even really the first several years after that, uh, you know, I tried the first non that first non-trader case, the Fakar case I told you about, that was in 2019. So, you know, if the, the first spoofing trial that I, that I won was, you know, the first several cases was 2016. So for those first three, four years, there was all sorts of discussion of spoofing and concern about spoofing. It was a topic at every conference and every panel. And at that point, you know, you, you developed a lot of awareness in the space. So communications would routinely be going out to traders, informing them about spoofing, which made it easier for uh, regulators to prove that th their intent, prove that they knew that this was uh, unlawful activity and so on. Now it's, it's almost passe. Everyone sort of understands what spoofing is. It's not the hot thing to talk about from a regulatory perspective the way it was five years ago. Um, and I think that has also changed how spoofing occurs. It's generally done by by lone uh, um, actors now, not big teams of people who are being taught how to spoof by their supervisors or their colleagues, but, you know, working together and creating a lot of communications about spoofing. It's more of a one-off activity, usually by less sophisticated traders uh, I have joked, you know, I call them caveman spoofers, uh, where you've got these the people who are not super sophisticated traders engaging in it, and the and the amounts are are much smaller usually as well. How important is collabor collaboration between regulators, um, exchanges, and market participants in combating spoofing in the present day? Uh, it's very important. Uh, regulators do routinely meet and discuss. They did back when I was. Uh, working with them as a prosecutor, but they certainly still do. You're starting to see, you know, more and more actions that are brought by the SEC and CFTC working together. Um, but of course, there's also, you know, SROs like FINRA and, and NFA, but all these, also all the exchanges working together, exchanging information and, and um, cooperating. Um, but it's always more challenging uh, for regulators to act when some of the conduct is on one exchange and some of it's on another, particularly if some of it is in the future space and some of it is not. Um, it, it can be more difficult to detect. And also by requiring the coordination between different regulators, it also creates an obstacle or a cost associated with that enforcement activity. So it definitely can mean fewer um, and less aggressive uh, enforcement act, uh, actions uh, in, in that type for that type of activity. 
for someone getting, engaging in the market, maybe testing software, maybe becoming a new trader, what is your advice to them to make sure that they stay clear from spoofing allegations? <laughs> Great question. So first of all, if you're testing anything, do it in a test environment, not in a live market, in a live trading setting. But separate from that, if, you're, if you are trading, first of all, think about what you're doing if you're entering large size in the market. And obviously large is a, uh, uh, a matter of opinion, but I would say large compared to the typical order uh, quantities that you're seeing at the top of the book. I mean, if you if there's ones and twos near the top of the book, and you suddenly come in with 100. Why are you doing that? How long are you leaving it in? Why are you canceling now? Why are you moving it away from the top of the book? That sort of thing. Those questions should be asked, should be thought about. Um, if you have a strategy that involves predetermined cancellation, say cancellation by a uh, algorithm or something along those lines where it's part of the strategy or it's routine for the strategy to, to engage in cancellation, you need to think about that cancellation logic and ensure that it is key to an event that's occurring in the market rather than just being automatic after a period of time so that you know ultimately there, there can be an assurance to regulators that the orders you're entering are bona fide. In other words, that they're being entered with the intent to trade rather than the intent to do something else. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, a well thought out work process so you can elaborate to yourself and if ever asked to someone else why you're making the decisions that you're making. Um, but also if you're trading a system that's reactionary to market implications, not a time base, not something that's gonna just trigger um, because you want to disappear position, right? Something that can be backed by market movements or some type of reactive chain. Um, so that's that's great to hear. Would, would you say that's correct in my, you know, my assumptions there? Yeah, I mean, I think you definitely want to have a well thought out explanation for yeah. why you're making a cancellation. Yes. You also want to tie it to something happening in the market. Yeah. So that this way it's not like, hey, I just changed my mind which is harder for the regulators to buy, but uh, it's, it's actually, oh, it's because I saw this price moving else or something else. That's great. And so my, my last piece that I, I want to know uh, advice from you is someone that wants to pursue, you know, the legal field and, and study what you studied and, and attack this career like you've taken on here throughout your career. What advice do you have for them to really, you know, break their way into white collar crime and, you know, the corporate finance uh, uh, of law? A couple things. I mean, I think obviously you're going to want to do well in law school and go to a good law firm and so on. Um, for me, specializing in this area, you know, was has been a real uh, boon for my career. It's been exciting and interesting and complex and fun. But, you know, that requires, there's not a lot of firms and lawyers who do it. So you really need to search out um, before you start uh, at a law firm and make sure you're uh, you're working with lawyers who actually are working in this space. Um, similarly, um, I do think the government is a fantastic way to go to get experience. The way I did it is less um, direct and, you know, really it's just a fortuitous circumstance where I happened to be a prosecutor in Chicago. I was f interested in financial crime and really expressed an interest in doing these cases and was fortunate enough to receive that work. And Renato, we appreciate your time and insights into spoofing. Your wealth of experience and expertise has provided a unique and enriching perspective, contributing significantly to our exploration of financial futures. Thank you for being a part of Futures Discovery. Thank you very much. If you're enjoying the content today on Futures Discovery and want to learn more about derivative markets, look at some other videos on our series, but also check out Options Discovery hosted by Esma to learn more about the space. 